Hello everyone and a very very warm welcome to you all. Okay now as the title of the video suggests this is going to be all about the Flying Scotsman. Now there are thousands if not millions of people around the world who've heard the name the Flying Scotsman and uh, when you mention the name uh, most people who, who have heard of it uh, will automatically think about the locomotive being the Gresley designed A1 uh, later reclassed to the A3 and so it should have that recognition um, particularly because it is classed as the most famous locomotive in the world but it's not quite how the story starts I'll explain in 1862, on the East Coast Line of the UK, originally called the Special Scotch Express, here is something that a lot of people possibly won't know, even though they've heard of the name Flying Scotsman. Originally, it was nothing to do with the locomotive, or a given locomotive, it was actually the name of the train. And that ran for, I think it was eight years, to 1870, um, by various companies across the East Coast line and I'll give you some examples these would be uh, the NBR which is North British Railway uh, the North Eastern Railway NER and Great Northern Railway GNR just stepping back a couple of years here to 1860 uh, we saw the three companies just just mentioned there um, established the East Coast Joint Stock uh, the passenger stock um, and this is basically how the Flying Scotchman train came to be this would run of course between uh, Edinburgh General Station uh, to King's Cross in London and of course vice versa for the return journey now, the first eight years to 1870 are a bit vague with respect to exact locos and rolling stock. I can't find any photos or information on this apart from who controlled each portion of the line and from where and to each section operated. So after drawing blanks on trying to find some photos and a bit more information about the locos and uh, rolling stock for that first eight year period, um, I spotted a book for sale called The Flying Scotsman, 1862 to 1962, um, and it was 99p, second hand, and it's got the first bit of information on that covers that eight years, and I'm going to go through that right now. Um, looking now at this uh, not so good image and the reason it's not so good is because I've searched the internet looking for good images for Hawthorne's um, locomotive 222 running number 371 X Leeds Northern um, and I can't find any which is really silly um, all I can find is a kind of a blueprint uh, type drawing of it um, so yeah uh, basically what I've done I've taken a photo um, out of the book what I mentioned earlier this then is the kind of locomotive that would be seen on the northeastern uh, around the uh, 1860s uh, and particularly before the period of 1862 which is where the story really starts and before we actually make a start in the year 1862 um, there's a couple of locos I'd like to put out on the layout and show you stay with me well here we are then on the layout which you will see in a few seconds and uh, now the reason I wanted to introduce you to these two locomotives is quite simply this as you know I've just said getting all the, any pictures of Hawthorne's locomotive 371 has been ridiculously hard and I've only got this one picture you've just seen and uh, getting hold of a real model would be wow but I can't find one in the world anywhere so uh, I thought what would be a nice little touch is to introduce you to a couple of locomotives and train sort of thing that actually um, were very similar to what you would have seen on that line between uh, 1862 and 1870 so check this out and so the first little baby to come round is this one what a beauty as well just check this out guys Oh, look at that. Oh, brilliant. Right, um, quite a famous locomotive. This, this is Lion, uh, number 57. She was built in 1838 for the Liverpool and Manchester line. Now, she's quite famous, actually, because she's been featured in three British films, and the um, one she's probably most famous for is Titfield Thunderbolt. Now, uh, I have done a video on Titfield Thunderbolt, um, and this is the first time, second time I've ever run her. So um, she's normally up on the layout at the back. So looking forward to that. Now I'll just leave her there because I want to bring the second one into play and let you have a look at the next one. Here it comes, another beautiful little thing. Oh, come on. Don't they just, oh, they're amazing. Right, I'll tell you about this one. This one's called the Adler. 
and which is German for eagle by the way. Uh, she was built in 1935 uh, in Newcastle um, with the combined efforts of uh, George and Robert Stevenson who you may know uh, they were the guys behind uh, the rocket and they built this specially for uh, Germany so this particular model is an HO scale um, but it doesn't look too bad anyway they look great together um, and I believe it was for Strasbourg in Germany they built it for and uh, there has been a replica one made I don't think the original one exists anymore so there's the two of them now look the only point and the reason I'm showing you these is simply and purely because like I said between 1862 and 1870 finding anything locomotive wise pretty much and sort of rolling stock wise um, is, is virtually non-existent but these are a very good guide as to what the locomotives of that period of time used to sort of kind of look like so I think we've got to take these around really haven't we? we've just got to do that so come on let's just do it oh she's wheel spinning a bit oh come on girl that's better she's gripped this is a cast chassis, uh, cast one it's really heavy really is heavy but having said that there's only much that she can so much that she can pull of course right just get her around and then we'll get the Adler moving as well here she comes oh this looks amazing look oh brilliant super 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 duper right come on then Adler this is a trick by the way and she's quite nippy this one the lion is geared down a long way so you can't run her, and we don't want to run him fast anyway, but you can't fly around. But the tricks one, the Adler, that one will fly, but I'm not going to do that. We're just going to enjoy them as they are, like sensible speeds. That, oh, don't they just look... Uh, yes, this is certainly the styles of locomotive that you would see in that period of time. A lovely look, they are beautiful. Come on, Adler. Yeah. in. Get him over here for you. They're fantastic together, they really do. Couple of shots along the room. Oh that was good. I'm glad they weren't behind each other then, that was great. Come on ladies. Oh yes. Fantasy Dobo. Well that just about uh, does it. To say I'd rather show you something similar than show you nothing. Right let's get him to a stop. Adler first. Yeah, the, the motor in Adler actually is quite loud. I don't think it's not faulty or anything. It's just uh, just quite loud. The motor is actually in the uh, first coach here. Uh, oh, and I will point something out to you before we go. Bring it forward a bit. These normally go for around 150 to 250 quid for the set. I got this one as a real good price, but when it arrived some of the steps were broken off okay, they are fixed some on the other side but some of the steps about 10 of them were broken off um, and it's quite a job gluing them back on because uh, they've all broken off in different positions so you've got to find the right one to glue it back but of course I had a chat with the seller and um, yeah we came to a deal and I'll I tell you what I got this for a quarter of the of the normal going price so I am well pleased at that and I'm no problem in um, having to uh, glue them back on I'll do that uh, I'll do the rest of them in good time of course come on then last bit with the lion there she is uh, back her up so we can get a, a shot of the two of them come on yes there they are bloody lovely all right we'll move on to the 1970s uh, sorry no 1870 get it right <laughs> we'll move on to 1870 now 
Okay, as you can see, this uh, this image is uh, of a poster, uh, a BR poster from uh, 1962, uh, celebrating 100 years of the Flying Scotsman train. And of course, the actual locomotive Flying Scotsman will be in between that period somewhere. Um, yeah, it's a great poster. At the top on the left, you can see definitely a sterling single. It's not number one, but it's definitely a sterling single. And the bottom one is, of course, uh, Class 55 Celtic in BR Green. So just thought I'd show you that because it's a, a lovely poster and it tells a good story. The only thing is here, of course, it never really stopped in 1962. It carried on for much, much longer and still kind of around today. So let's move on. OK, uh, the 1870s seems to be where all the information out there on the internet becomes much, much more available. There's a lot of it. And again, you need to Google it if you want to look for all the fine details. It's not a problem, just do that. So then, in 1870, we saw the introduction of Patrick Sterling's locomotive called Sterling Single No. 1. Now, 53 of these were built between nine, uh, sorry, 1870 and 1895, and it seems that No. 1 started hauling the train in or around 1870, and did so until around 1898 or 1900, which we're going to stop at, uh, for the moment, that is. Um, now, the Sterling Singles are absolutely beautiful locomotives. They are super-duper looking locomotives. Um, I have read somewhere that aesthetically they were classed as the best looking steam locomotive ever in the UK and to be honest with you, you know looking at it, I think I would have to agree with this. I'm going to show you a couple of photos of the original one now. Here she is then, preserved in the uh, National Railway Museum in York, the NRM. And what a corker she is, just look at this locomotive, it is beautiful, period. I'll also give you an interesting story here about the tender. Now, when she was first uh, found and, and bought uh, by the uh, NRM to get, to get it, uh, you know, rebuilt, preserved, blah, 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 uh, the tender that was with her was actually not the original one. The tender was what's called a Sturrock tender. Um, I'll talk to you more about that later. Um, and, but they did, you know, refurbish both the locomotive and the tender, and for a while that's how it remained. Uh, but sometime later, I don't know the dates about this, by the way, but sometime later, her original tender was discovered, and if I have this right, if my memory serves me correct, it was discovered on a farm being used as a water trough for horses or something like that that type of story something similar to that of course it was one massive rust the National Railway Museum got it and they uh, completely stripped it rebuilt it refurbished it and she's now back with her original tender and the historic tender is course of course is there as well Please take a look now at this old black and white image um, of another Sterling single. It's clearly not number one because it, has, it hasn't got the, uh, the holes in the splash guards over the two main drive wheels, which are actually is a massive aesthetic thing for number one anyway. But if you look carefully, you can see that it's hauling about three uh, six-wheel coaches, which are fixed wheeled, they're not articulated. And then behind those, I believe that they are 12-wheelers uh, with twin six-wheel bogies. I think I'm right in saying that. You'll have to have a look at the photos yourself, the photo yourself and, and see what you think. But uh, nevertheless, what a great photo and what a great time it was in those days. In order to be able to do this video, I needed a Sterling single. Ha! Huh. Right. Nobody does one. Well, not quite. Um, there was a kit master version, which is basically just a, a plastic model that you glue and put together and paint yourself. Um, and to be honest with you guys, that's about it. I have found out that uh, the National Railway Museum is going to be doing one. It's going to be available in... Oh, let me get this right now. Is it... Uh, oh, Christ, not spring. It'll be autumn of 2016, so that's... A, Close, a, close on a year away. Uh, I believe it's being produced by Prado, if I've got that name correct, uh, and it's nearly 200 quid. Um, and I didn't want to wait that long. I wanted to do it now. I've been waiting to do this video of the Flying Scotsman story for a long, long, long time. So I went down a different route, and I'll tell you what that is. Having a look at this next image, this is a kit model, uh, like I said, I think it's called Kitmaster, and it is purely and simply a plastic model that you glue together and paint yourself. It had been done quite well, and I think I paid 20 quid for it, which is not a big deal. The reason I did this is because I'd heard... Um, 
from a few sources that the Backman Emily, which is part of the Thomas range, and I know of course is based on the Stirling single, uh, I've heard that a lot of people have basically converted one of those to a Stirling single. Now, if you look at this image here of the Backman Emily, you'll see that it, it is based on the Stirling single, but there's a lot of things that aren't quite correct on it. But how do you correct them? Well, I'll tell you the way I did it. I bundled them all into a parcel and I sent them to my dear friend Eric in Slovenia. And this is the final result. Are you all slurping yet? I know I am. Bet you'd just love to see it close up and running. Yeah, I bet your bottom dolly you will. Right, let's get this show on the road now. Less of the talking, more of the action from now to the end of the video. And so here we go, guys. Coming round in all her glory just check this out guys just look at that oh man Whew. look at that what an amazing job Eric's made to her it's hard to believe that it's even the same loco just look at that ow wow I'm really pleased with the result and this is going to be a cracker to run. Let's just move her up a little bit for you. I'm going to show you inside cap what it's done. Just carefully swing around there look. Don't know what in the cab look. Oh it's brilliant. She's absolutely scorching gorgeous. Right, let me get a pointer and show you a couple of things. Now, when uh, Eric did the con conversion, uh, the original Emily, which was obviously the main body, didn't have the holes in the splash guard there over the two main drivers. So we had to cut the pieces out of the um, uh, plastic model one and then replace them into there. Uh, now, there are some differences between the original Emily and the original Sterling single, and I'll point a couple of them out to you. This being the Emily body, uh, the toolbox section, well the, the, the raised section here, those two aren't actually the same as the original Sterling number one. I did know that, but I didn't want to bother out with that point. I think the chimney stack is slightly too tall or slightly small, I'm not sure which. Um, and also, if you see the cab roof here, well, if I can just hold still and point it to you, the, the Sterling single the, straight up there, it doesn't have that slight fold back there uh, again I did know that and I didn't bother telling Eric to take it off I was quite happy to leave it as it is but come on guys hasn't he made a beautiful job of a I mean oh, look at that wow you know what time to put some coaches on and coaches it is okay we're going to start with just two and I want to show you these and tell you all about them right these are the correct type of coaches, as you can see, it's a six wheel one, it's a solid axles, no articulated uh, bogies on them. Now, these are actually, again, from the uh, Thomas the Tank engine range, these are Emily's uh, coach and brake coach. Now, the only difference between the two, originally, because they're in that bland horrible green with the yellow lines around them, is that the window inserts on the brake uh, just got two of them whitened out. Uh, but the proper brake looks more like this. And this brings me back to my friend in Slovenia, Eric, because he's done both of these for me. He's resprayed them to the dark brown, given the dark brown look. And he's also blocked in all the windows there, look. You can see there's three of them, three or four of them blocked in. Uh, just leaving three, which is exactly like the original coach. And he's put all the new decals on, as you can see there, look, the number, the luggage. And uh, yeah, God, it's brilliant. He's made a great job of them. Now, the original six wheelers don't have the clerestory roof like that. I, he could have taken that off, but I told him not to bother. I'm quite happy to live with them as they are. But again, you can see how good Eric's work is. And with that, I think, oh, I forgot to say, yes, also, uh, if you look at this Hornby one here, you've got all the uh, gold, yellowy uh, lines around everywhere. Um, and the others do need doing like that. 
but unfortunately uh, Eric bless him tried to get them to me before Christmas because I wanted to get this video done over the Christmas period but unfortunately because of the Christmas post that didn't happen so I've decided to knock it on dead as a Christmas video and basically just as a video to add to my uh, to my collection of YouTube videos and um, you'll see also he's put the uh, handrails there on the sides they were they weren't on it metal handrails there and what he's done is ordered some micro scale uh, straight lines um, I'm going to send the two coaches back to him uh, sometime soon and then we'll get them done completely finished right so here we go then let's just take a round let you have a look at it actually moving with them on oh she's moved me a lot oh yes don't you just love it all right let's get her across for you come on babs there she is oh fantastic absolutely fantastic so what I'll do I'll bring her to the front for a minute because I'm going to put some more coaches on her uh, I've not got any more of those I'm going to put some of the Hornby ones on as well uh, but I just want to stop her here <laughs> brill absolutely brill right as I say I'm going to put some more coaches on her just a couple more because she's not got a, a massive a pulling ability because obviously the drives in on, it's on two of the wheels actually it's on the back bogey one and the main big one but there's no uh, tyres no traction tyres or anything so she can't pull a lot but four, four looks okay uh, and now what I'm going to do we're going to move on now because she's going to make an appearance again in a little while so she will be back for another star appearance so uh, time to move on to the next bit stay with me Next then, we're going to talk about uh, the 1900s, uh, around 1900 to 1923, so a uh, 23 year span there. Right, now, uh, the Sterling singles were used for 30 years more or less, and it was around 1900 that the problem started to happen. What it basically is, the Sterling singles were being stretched and taxed to maximum traction, um, with more and more coaches being added to the train because more and more people were requiring to, to travel on it. Um, and of course the Locos only had a single driving wheel, and that did cause some slippage. And around about this time is where things started to change again. A gentleman stepped in by the name of Mr. Henry Ivat. Um, his British Atlantic class C1 and then I think it was a C2 as well, um, they're 442 of which 22 were made between 1898 and 1900, yeah that sounds about right, um, that these took over the job of hauling the Flying Scotchman train. These locomotives were known to be fast and lively and powerful runners. Um, the drivers were advised by Hyvert to hold back a bit on the speed on certain parts of the line, they were pretty, uh, pretty nifty. From the information that I uh, researched it, it appears that the Atlantic's uh, family of locos hauled the Flying Scotsman train until around 1922-1923 uh, so that brings us a further 23 years on and this also brings us back to the layout where we can now have a proper look at one of Henry Ivatt's beautiful British Atlantic's C1 check it out guys oh god she's a lovely look Stop it there for a minute, let you have a look. Brilliant look. Now this is an NRM uh, special edition one. Uh, obviously you can see she's LNER, Apple Green, and the number 3251 there. The NRM stuff's really good. They don't mess around when it comes to uh, detail. Uh, there's a few detail parts I've put on, but uh, uh, I've not finished it all of them yet. Just for, get going in this video so just let her go past and then uh, we'll be back in a bit with uh, both of these going together so let's just do that there we go take around once at least now you'll see I've, I've done a mixture of coaches here we've got three of the four wheel ones and I'm not sure I think it's one two oh, one two three four five of the uh, six I've lost count now <laughs> yeah the clerestory roof ones anyway with the brake on the end first let's get a fly by lovely locomotive really is a beautiful loco here we go yes C1 
superb. Right, we'll get it to the front, uh, and then as I say, give me a couple of seconds and we'll have them both going together. Couldn't ask for anything better. Here you go, back in a couple of seconds. Alright then, as promised, these two beauties together. As it happens, I've managed to get five coaches on her. And she's doing it. Just got it to start off steady. Three of the four wheel ones and then those two lovely ones what Eric's done for me. So she's slipping a little bit, but once she gets going, it's not a problem. She just wouldn't quite pull six. Yes, she's doing it now, look. No worries. Right, next up. Now I've added two more of the four wheel coaches to this. That's all my four wheel coaches out now. Uh, along with all, six of the uh, cluster roof ones on the Atlantic here. So we'll get them both going to good speed and get some nice views for you. Yes. If she comes the Atlantic. Brilliant. Looks really good, guys. She's got a bat on, that's for sure. No trouble pulling these coaches at all. Cool. was good the good when the pass each other like that Could happen again. Yes. Well, these look great, guys. These have got the two of my favourite locomotives. They're just really, really nice. They are really nice. Hey guys, I'm in knees again. I was hoping to get the sterling then, but she got blocked out. Right, I'll get her this time, I'll stop the other one. Come on, girl, come on. Brilliant. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Right then. Cool. Let me just back her up a little bit. Come on, girl. Yeah, that'll do fine. Bring the uh, Atlantic across. Oh, by the way, while I was introducing the Atlantic to you earlier, I said I think there's a C2. That was a stupid thing to say because I know there's a C2. The C2 is actually called the large boiler, so this one being the C1 is obviously the small boiler. There you go, guys. Now time for a massive change. Around about this time is where things get even more exciting. In 1922, a new man uh, takes over the reins of the LNER and his name is Nigel Gresley, uh, later Sir Nigel Gresley. His design of the British 462 Pacific Class A1s, later uh, as A3s, uh, with 52 A1s built and 53, if I remember rightly, rebuilt to A3s and 27 new A3s, all between 1922 and 1935. 
1923 again, um, three of these Pacifics first rolled out of the workshops. Uh, one of them carried the uh, GNR, the Great Northern Railway, number 1472. However, in February of 1924, they renumbered it to 4472 and named it the Flying Scotsman. This renumbering was actually specially done for her presentation at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley in 1924 and 1925. It was done to impress everybody and it did. It left a massive impression on everybody over that two year period that visited the show. Nevertheless, it wasn't until May 1928 when she actually hauled the Flying Scotsman train. One other thing worth mentioning here is uh, it was four years earlier in 1924 uh, to coincide with the Wembley exhibition as well uh, that the LNER officially named the train the Flying Scotsman bearing in mind it was actually called the Special Scotch Express for all those years before but it did actually have the Flying Scotsman as a nickname since as far back as 1870. And so, in just a few seconds, it's going to be showtime on the layout. And from here on, we're going to be talking not only about the Flying Scotsman train, but the Flying Scotsman locomotive as well. Before we commence with the rest of the action, just have a look at this image that I've managed to uh, capture from a, a BBC video on YouTube. Um, it's not brilliant quality, but it's, it's OK. Um, this was actually taken either in 1924 or 1925 when she was at the British Empire Exhibition in Wembley. If you look closely, you can actually see that there's a coat of arms on the side of the cab. The LNER and the number 4472 are actually both on the tender. And also, if you take a close look at the tender, it's, uh, it, this would be its original tender. Um, and you'll be able to see the, the grill around the top, which was a common sight in those days for holding uh, the curl from falling off. So, yeah, absolutely brilliant photo. So, come on, let's get on the layout. Here we go then, gang. It's the 1st of May 1928 and here she is ready to pull the inaugural run of the Flying Scotsman train. Now as you can see she's 4472 of course but it's actually on the cab there and the tender is not the same as the one in the photo that you saw because this is a specially designed tender by Nigel Gresley uh, which has a, a corridor through it which allows two sets of crew on the train so they can get through to the cab to change over roughly halfway for the 900, sorry, 393 mile journey from uh, London to Edinburgh and there she is look looks fantastic and I will before we run I will just point out to you here this one and you can see that's got the coat of arms there she is, there she is, look on the side and, and my gut feeling is that uh, because of the uh, four year difference between that photo you've just seen and the uh, this, this day 1st of May 1928 that's obviously that's why those numbers must have been moved and put onto the uh, cab um, allowing for the big extra tender there so right, let's have a move in Oh yeah, and, and here you can see she's uh, sporting her uh, lovely plaque on the front, Flying Scotsman, which she's uh, so very famous for. Uh, I nearly forgot to put it on, <laughs> so uh, I just remembered in time. So come on, let's do this. Now the tender has chuff in it, chuff chuff, and I'm sure you're going to hear it. And I've kitted her out with a lovely rate of the tinks, a pretty obvious choice really. Let's, let's just do this, come on. The first ever run of the Flying Scotsman train. Yes. Have a flyby. Superb. Yeah, we're on the inside line here, guys, we're on first radius curve, so she's doing well. Yeah, she's doing good on that. Fantastic. Now, it was this uh, May the 1st, 1928 run, pulling the Flying Scotsman train for the first time, that she actually made her first world record. Because she covered the 392 miles, non-stop, the first time any steam locomotive anywhere in the world had ever done this and she achieved it not only with the tender with the uh, corridor to allow two sets of crew to do the journey but also through water troughs 
stuck in the middle of the track which she picked up on the way through without stopping. Brilliant. But what we're going to do, we are going to stop her here. We're just going to stop her here, look. Oh, doesn't that look great? Yeah. This loco, by the way, is a quite an early Hornby one. It's just outside the Triumph era, but it's definitely an early Hornby. Right, so that was 1928. Let's have a look what's uh, next on the calendar scale. Up next then, it's time to bring in this one. Gently does it. See the lamps on the front and I got one of them a bit too far out so I <laughs> have to live with that now <laughs> not the end of the world right here she comes look now this is the one you saw shot a while ago briefly and I showed you the coat of arms so I'll just get it to there there she is right now this is the uh, dark, slightly darker green one it's uh, still an LNER I think they call it Doncaster green if I remember rightly but there she is beautiful look now I've not put the plaque on the front Flying Scotsman plaque uh, for one very good reason because uh, this particular part of the video we're talking uh, 1934 and she did the run from London to Leeds and Leeds back to London uh, I believe she pulled four coaches in the up journey and two more were added for the down journey now this is the journey in which she made the speed record of 100.6 100 100 miles an hour uh, now, the thing is, I, I know there were six cars on that return journey, and one of the cars was a dynamiter car. Now, um, this is a model that I've never seen. Um, possibly somebody might have made one for themselves, but I've never actually seen one. I do know for a fact that the dynamiter coach car, whatever you want to call it, was uh, that kind, Grizzly ones but um, it was converted obviously to be the dynamic car uh, I will just point out to you also that this locomotive is part of the twin tender set or one of them of all the ones I've got so I just thought I'd show you that um, just to let you know because obviously we're not showing the number on the side there but we all know what it is anyway so what I've done I've referred back to the cholesterol roof ones because it, that gave me the opportunity to put three of them on and then use the black engineers coach which is also a cholesterol roof um, as a pretend dynamiter car for want of a better expression so then of course to keep making up the total of six put uh, two more on the back end there the last one of course being the brake so let's just get around a couple of times right there we go looks cool yeah, I wish I could have got all of the dynamo dynamiter cars, but anyway, yes, I just love it, still looks the part though, still looks great, get a, a whiz by, it's time, go for it, brilliant, brilliant, right, let's uh, bring it to a stop just here, look, there superb right uh, stay with me and we'll move on uh, to uh, 1939 third up today then everybody here she comes gorgeous beautiful here she is in wartime black stop her there let you have a look okay now I haven't put any lamps on the front um, I don't know if they would be used during the war years I'm really not sure I can't quite get my head around that whether they would have done or not obviously in war years would everything would be blacked out as many lights would be out as possible but there she is she absolutely gorgeous look uh, obviously any on the side there uh, the number 502 which was her third number in and 103 is on the other side uh, which was her fourth, fourth number before she ended up being 60103 being the final number now 
Uh, this one, uh, I obviously haven't put the Flying Scotsman plaque on either, that would also be stupid. Um, so what I've done, this being the War Years one, and it really is lovely. Uh, this is a, quite a new one, it's not that old actually, it's been out that long. This is exactly how she looks at the moment, uh, down at the NRM, who've completely restored her. Um, and I believe the, the test runs are going to be done in January, so that's not well, far away, so it's January 2016 obviously. And those test runs, uh, after the test runs, she's going to be uh, repainted now back to the original uh, green of her last livery when she was 60103. So yeah, so look, now with this being the war years, what I've done, quite simply, just take her along slowly a little bit for, first for you, just point out to you what I've done here right this um, I've finished the three coaches from the First World War um, Buckman set now uh, obviously the First World War finished um, what was it oh 14 to 18 I think yeah and then this 1939 it's not unreasonable to think that these coaches would still be in use so I thought well I'll put those on and then I'll follow up with a massive well massive pretty long rake of uh, livestock and goodness gracious me you'd see all sorts being moved in the war now I did notice something when I started her a few minutes ago and I'm hoping she's going to do it again for you now she's actually wheel slipping a little bit and it looks really good look so just just get it going oh yeah she's done it she's done it brilliant yeah I thought it looked pretty cool that did so here we go now I know I've used the southern region cattle and then there's some uh, non-region uh, ones uh, but it doesn't matter I mean goodness gracious me during the war years she would have been doing her duties same as any other locomotive and she would have been sent all over the country so you know who knows yeah I think they hit the wheels they actually look quite good um, yeah and like Mr. Soto was saying anyway um, quite simply I mean I'm sure she would have been sent all over the country and um, pulling whatever was needed to be pulled so yeah just get another run by for you beautiful locomotive superb well, we'll get the halt done just here Alright, that's fine there. And um, get this onto the computer back in a minute. Alright everybody, if you're up for this, um, for the first time in this video, let's uh, have all three of these going together. Just do this. Second up, the Leeds London special, the one which she made the 100.6 mile an hour mark. Well, that was good, <laughs> I like that. And the war years, let's go for this as well. Looking good guys, looking good. I'm not sure about the period of time with that bogey brake van there. Mm, somebody have to tell me if I've got the date wrong on that. I don't know if that would have been around in the Second World War. Just good, isn't it? I mean, very simple idea. A bit of emery paper on the spring, a little box to amplify the noise. <laughs> There's a job there. Yeah. 
it looks really good. I'll roll it up. Very happy with this so far. Now everybody, if you're enjoying this, which I hope you are, then this is only the tip of the iceberg because I've got loads more to show you yet. And I'm serious, I mean loads more. Okay, I've got one minute left on the camera, so put it around. Now, guys, there's something uh, quite important I need to run by you here. Up to now, you've seen three locomotives out of Pub the Flying Scotsman train, the Stirling Single first, then you saw the uh, Ivor Atlantic, then you've seen the uh, uh, Cl Class A183s. Now, um, the thing is, those three locomotives, they weren't the only three from the uh, types to actually pull the train. In other words, as, as an example, um, although Stirling Single number one is the, the definite pull the train, there are other Stirling Singles used to pull it, and same thing with the uh, Ivor Atlantic, there was more than one used to pull it, and the same thing with the A1s and the A3s, there was more than just the Flying Scotsman named locomotive to pull it, there was others as well. Now here we've just jumped back to 1935 for a very good reason, because uh, following the uh, uh, A3s, uh, they were starting to be withdrawn in, or in and around 1935 from pulling the uh, Flying Scotsman train, because the A4s started to take the place, and I have four A4s in my collection, um, and so I thought it would be a good idea to show all four of them to you at this point in the video. Alright, first up then, bring her through, Golden Eagle, featured here in the last video actually, but I've put uh, all the uh, Thompson, Thompson, Thompson teaks on, <laughs> get your words right, <laughs> yep, so we get her around, looking cool, yes, just what the doctor ordered, right, uh, next up we've got Mallard, and I've got her pulling uh, the Kalesfiru horns, Let's go for that. Nice one. And then here we've got uh, William Whitelaw in beautiful war black. Any again, number four look. So let's uh, have her moving as well. Yeah, and she's got some of the beautiful. LNERT, so I've added an extra sleeping car on as well. So that looks really, really good. This is busy. <laughs> well busy. Right, let's see if we can get some good shots. Yep, I've got it all. I put them all going around the same way, anti clockwise. It's a good chance to get few more good shots for you. <coughs> Come on, will you, White Law? Yes. There he is. Cool. Oh, oh yeah. Hold the needle. Shots along the room. Oh, it's a good view, this one. Lovely jubbly. Here we go. Tell you what would be nice, all three of them coming round together. I don't know if it's going to happen, but that would be pretty cool if it did. <laughs> so two, three, one after each other. Oh, we might get it this time. It could happen. I don't know. It could happen.
like you'll see here I've added sort of link in there it's a double header that's all four of my A4s uh, to date that is of course yes oh yeah that is superb together particularly the silver and the black that looks great all right well we're gonna have to move on so what more to come i'll be back with you in a few seconds let's just get them to a stop first Loving it. Next up, my lord. She comes. Perfect. And lastly, Golden Eagle. Come on, girl. Come on, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Oh, bloody hell, that was perfect. There you go, guys. Golden Eagle, Mallard, William Whitelaw, and Silver Link. Back with more goodies in a minute. I don't think it's fair not to give the diesels a mention at the beginning of their era. It was on October the 7th in 1958 when the famous train uh, pulled out of King's Cross behind the D207, a Type 4, that makes her a uh, Class 40. She managed about 2,000 horsepower and the wheel arrangement was a Wonko Co 1. The drive was on all six of the axles and she was made by the English Electric Company and the uh, Vulcan Foundry. It was in 1961 when the hauling duties became that of the uh, Class 55, the Deltics. Um, they were two power units in one uh, Coco uh, body shell and chassis and they were developing around 3,300 horsepower so that's near on twice as much. So just uh, a few minutes then in this uh, quite uh, detailed video uh, we just let's have a look at those two diesels. Radio, um, as you've now just seen what they both look like let's now see them in action. 1958 this is what it would have looked like coming out of the station that day for the first time pulling the uh, prestigious Lion Scotsman train. Now it's almost certain that at this point in time they would probably be all metal coaches now um, but as I'm not dwelling on the diesels I just literally left the coaches that are on the line uh, just so I can show you them in action. Yes, the class 40. Okay. Well, let's have now the beautiful Deltic. This is a Backman one, twin flywheels, all the lights, all the uh, singing and dancing. So yeah, you've just seen her, so we'll just take her round. Looking good. Yeah, looking pretty good, guys. Yeah, nice one. Let's get that Delta this time. Yes. Oh, super. Now listen, um, I've got a, a bell ringing in my head that I have, I think I've read somewhere that uh, the prototype Delta was actually used on an occasion to pull the train. So uh, I thought, well, a bit of fun. Yeah, let's do it. Here she is then, look. Uh, she's not a uh, very very expensive one, she's a, a Lima I think, yeah she's a Lima. She's not bad for detail though, not bad. It's not going to be as good as the Batman NRM special of course, but there she is. Yeah, and a couple of shots around the room. Good. Yeah, that was good. That's good. I get up. As I say, I'm not going to dwell on the diesel. Diesel. I'm just going to uh, just showing you this bit. I think it was worth adding it in. So with that, I'll fade it out, and we'll be back to the steamers in just a few seconds.
as we move into the Alan Pedler years, and if you don't know who Alan Pedler is, uh, that'll be explained in a few seconds, um, it's worth taking time out at this point to show you some of the differences between all the different variations of the Flying Scotsman locomotive, uh, particularly the differences between the A1 class and the A3 class. Here then is the wartime black one, what you saw earlier. Now, the differences mainly between the, um, the class A1 and the A3 is uh, usually three things. Uh, first of all, it's a uh, high pressure boiler, uh, a much greater superheater and a, a reduction in uh, cylinder sizes. Now one of the de dead giveaways for this is the patch on the side there of the smoke box is one each side and that's because the superheaters were wider and they would stick through the side of the smoke box so they, they were boxed in like that and that being the case that would suggest that all the models I have are all A3s. Here you can see her in a beautiful apple green and uh, she's got the uh, Carl Chap double chimney there and the German smoke deflectors which I know a lot of fans don't really like. Here we've got the way she looked uh, in 1963 when she was purchased by Alan Pedler. This is obviously in the Brunswick Green or BR Green as you can see there and she's sporting the double chimney again and again the German um, deflectors, smoke deflectors. Moving on to the wartime black one just for another couple of seconds um, the fact that she wasn't changed to an A3 uh, until 1947 means she must have been a class A1 through the war so the double chimney there would not be relevant it would not have been fitted at that time but I do know that eventually all the A1s were fitted uh, an A3 sorry were all fitted with the double chimney at some point here then is the one you saw a little bit earlier in the video this is the uh, uh, very early Hornby one and she's uh, in apple green again of course and just a single chimney and uh, she's also got a slightly different banjo I'll explain that to you in a second or two this one is the uh, original triangle one again single chimney yep needs a little bit of a touch up but you know it's another different model and this is how she looked when Alan Pedler had her transformed back to single chimney I removed the deflectors and had her done in her original LNER green uh, with the twin tender which he added I believe it was 1966. Now this is not apple green it's again I think it's called Doncaster green it's definitely a different shade. Yeah it can sometimes be a bit confusing about the colouring of the different liveries that she went through but uh, the, the bottom line is there was apple green, Doncaster green, uh, wartime black and Brunswick Green, BR Green, which is the triangle there. So uh, a little bit of information there for you. Oh, and I do apologise, uh, I've just remembered she was done in uh, BR Express Blue for uh, about three years, if my memory serves me well. So sorry about that. Right, just a little bit of info about the domes. The original A1s would have had a, a round dome. Uh, later they got changed to the Banjo Dome, which you can see there, that one, and here they're both the same. Now if you look at this one it's slightly bigger look and the same thing applies to these three as well. Just carefully come over for you. Yeah, on the black one that's the large banjo dome and so is that and so is that. Now all the A1s had the round dome and when the conversions were done to uh, the A3s the dome was not part of that conversion but some of them got changed and some of, some of them didn't. So there you go, that's a little bit of info about the domes. From here then is how the story goes. In 1962 British Railways announced that they would be scrapping the Flying Scotsman locomotive in early 1963. It was in January of 1963 that a fairly wealthy entrepreneur named Alan Pegler, who happened to live in Nottinghamshire, um, bought her from British Rail for £3,000 cash, and uh, that would have been a lot of money back in those days, and he saved her from the uh, breaker's yard by the skin of her teeth. At the time of uh, buying her, this is exactly what she would have looked like. 60103 uh, in Brunswick Green, PR Green, and it would have the Carl Chap double chimney along with the uh, German type smoke deflectors. In the last run up years to 1963 she was uh, sent all over the country. She wasn't pulling the uh, uh, Flying Scotsman train on the East Coast Line anymore, not particularly. She was uh, all over the country and she was pulling all kinds of rolling stock so I don't have any problem in showing you this, the, this particular version now just running through with a few LMS 
coaches, a couple of East Coast maroon sleepers, because that is typically what it would have been like. It would have been pulling all sorts of coaches from any part of the country. Just get around to here for you. There is fine where she started from, and I'll tell you what Alan Pegler did. Alan spent the next six years spending large amounts of money and having her restored, maintained and serviced regularly. He also had her return to her original LNER livery, including the removal of the double chimney and smoke deflectors. It's almost certain that he did this for a very special reason that coincidentally was very close to his heart. Remember the black and white image from uh, earlier on in the video where she was on display at the Wembley exhibition in 1924-5? Well, Alan was taken there at the age of four or five by his uncle and he even sat in the driver's seat. So this was no doubt to instill his first interest in trains. Little did he know back then he would own her some 38, 39 years later. When she was ready to resume service, Alan persuaded the British Rail Board to allow her to be run on the rail network for enthusiasts and rail tours, etc. At this time, she was the only steam locomotive to be doing so. During these years, she toured very successfully from one end of the country to the other. The double tender was actually added in 1966 because uh, the water troughs that used to be used for scooping up the water on uh, fast moving trains um, were slowly disappearing. So um, he bought another tender and had it converted to the water tender, which is exactly what you can see here now. During 1968, Alan wanted to recreate the London to Edinburgh non-stop run of 1928 on its 40th anniversary. This he completed very successfully, arriving at Edinburgh Station in under eight hours. Let's then now do a recreation of that uh, run in 1968. Okay, here we go, let's do this. Come on, girl. Yes. Now I must apologise. Uh, I'd only had five suitable coaches, but I knew she was pulling eight on that uh, second attempt London to Edinburgh in 1968 so I'm sorry I've had to uh, put three different types of coaches together for this so you'll have to forgive me for that but apart from the two different periods of coaches then this is pretty much what she looked like and it was yet another successful run at the time that looks good I'll bring the other one around as well, the last deliberate version before uh, she nearly got scrapped. There we go, see them both running together. Wicked, oh yeah, wicked. Yeah, they've both got a good bat on. Slow the inner one down a bit actually. <laughs> Been a bit too fast. Think I like it. Right. Guess it was a bit too fast. Real. Yeah, the the brake band on the uh, on the end of the, this outer one here, the right rubber on the wheels. Still got the old triangle wheels on mine, but you should see it. There, oh, it's got a right wobble on. Yeah, it's got the old plastic wheels on, and I, I don't think I've even cleaned them on that one, so. Yeah. Yeah, looks really good, guys. Alright, couple come down the room. Then we're just about done at this part. The kid. Right, 
Oh, there we go. I think what we'll do now, we'll have a, another fade here and then we'll move just one year to 1969. Back in two shapes of a lamb's tail. It was quite late on in 1968 when the contract agreement was coming to an end with British Rail. The Board of Directors had decided that they didn't want any more steam on the rail network and this included Flying Scotsman. This being the case, Alan Pegler thought to himself, well, if it's not going to make any money in the UK, I'll take it somewhere where it will. And he took it to the big US of A. And here she is at the Doncaster Works where she was originally built in 1923, uh, featuring the accessories that were required by American law. She's fitted with a cow catcher, book eye couplings, the bell and the side whistle. Watney's, which is a brewery company here in the UK, um, took an old Devon Bell uh, observation coach and they converted it into like a, a travelling pub and um, that went across with her as well and you'll see what that looks like in a minute. And so here she comes, looking exactly like she did when she was unloaded onto the dockside in the US. Check this one out everyone. She is a cork look, she's beautiful. And this is an engine driven one by the way, it's not loco driven, as in the previous double tender one you saw. Right, this of course is the Hornby model, it's another one of those uh, um, specials, you know, uh, limited edition of 500 or 1000 or whatever, I can't remember what number this one is anyway. Uh, but she was, you know, they did quite a good job on her. Um, as you can see, she's uh, fitted with the Buckeye coupling, she's fitted with the cow catcher, uh, she's fitted with the bell and the side whistle all those items have been required by law over there in america like i said um, and the only thing is that uh, a little bit disappointed with hornby, hornby on this one because what they've done on the box it says this is how it appeared when it left doncaster for its trip to the us well i must admit the headlamp on the top there was not fitted until she was in the states and neither was the flying scotsman plaque on the front so obviously I put those two on the light is not a working one but I do intend to fit a working one at some point in time so I think with the amount of money that Hornby have made out of you and me over the years with all these different versions of the Flying Scotsman I think they could have gone the extra mile and put a working lamp on the top and maybe the plaque on the front but you know that's what it is and it is a good one it runs really well and I'll just bring her forward because I, I want to show you the uh, Slow running is brilliant on a look at that. Yeah, it's one of the uh, real good ones this is with from Hornby. Right, coat of arms on the side there, exactly as it was when Alan Pedler had her redone. And if you come along here, you can now see the observation car. It has got internal lighting. This is the observation car, which was uh, converted by uh, Watney's, the brewery company here in the UK, like I mentioned. Uh, it was kind of converted to a tavern bar for everybody and uh, I bet they had some great parties in that. So, uh, what I'll do, I'm just going to reverse her again because this brings us to the end of part one. So there she is then in all her glory. And part two, well, I'll tell you all about part two in a second or two stay with me for the final bit okay one final story for you here i've had it in mind to do the flying scotsman story for a very very long time i know i said that earlier at the time of starting to do it i knew there was going to be a lot to tell and a lot to show um, and i knew it was going to be a long video but i didn't realize that it was going to be as long as it was and once I realised that, I decided it was probably best to split it into two sections, parts one and part two. Part two I shall be starting on right away. Um, so if you've enjoyed this one, then, you know, hang in there because part two won't be far behind. In part two, I can promise you that it will be just as interesting and hopefully exciting and uh, maybe even better than part one. 
I can also promise you that apart from the last locomotive, or the version of the locomotive I should say, uh, being Flying Scotsman with its uh, US uh, accessories on it, um, apart from that one, which you're going to see now, uh, coming up, with all her um, American rolling stock on her, uh, and across the uh, west coast uh, of the US, you'll see all of that happening. And uh, apart from that one loco, you're not going to see any repeat locos at all. So um, it's going to be a cracker. It's going to be a ball. You need to watch out for number two, which is coming pretty soon. So until part two is completed, I wish you good night. God bless. Thanks for watching. Hope you've enjoyed. It's been a massive, massive, humongous undertaking to do this. Not counting the, uh, uh, the, the cost, the time the research and everything and I always try and present everything as accurately as possible and if I have made any mistakes I'm always open to people to let me know because I want to do things right if I made a mistake you need to let me know and tell me what it is and what it, what it was um, but at the end of the day you know I hope you've enjoyed the video it is very very special I've never undertaken anything as ambitious as this before so uh, I've got some new software as well which I'm now using for doing all the editing and it takes a massive amount of time to do this but i think i'm getting the grasp of it i think i'm improving and uh, i'd like your comments on that as well so look you know do take care of each other take care of yourselves stick out there for part two and i'll uh, see you when i do good night god bless everybody the champs one two three signing off john here bye